In Conversation Hi everyone, I am pleased to be here in conversation with Ambassador Vinay Tomalapali, uh, who was the U.S. Ambassador to Belize from 2009 to 2013. Ambassador, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. So, with an extensive background in the private sector, what sort of led you to become um, a foreign service officer and more specifically an ambassador? Thanks for the question. Thanks for this opportunity. Um, back in the first round, first election, 2007 and eight, uh, my wife and I um, worked on President Obama's campaign extensively. Um, in addition to campaign work, uh, I was on uh, the President's uh, National Finance Committee and so on. So some of us received um, a questionnaire from the administration uh, asking if we would be interested uh, in serving the Obama-Biden administration and I responded saying that yes, uh, I had checked a number of boxes which included uh, the closest thing that came to an ambassadorship was a, a high level position in the USAID. So this was my way of giving back uh, to the United States. Uh, this, uh, my adopted country has been so good to us, myself, my wife, yeah. our kids and the rest of our family. So that sort of motivated me to switch gears uh, from uh, my private sector life to uh, uh, public sector, uh, public sector uh, work. So that was kind of the segue. And uh, um, in early 2009, actually end of March, I received a call from the president asking if I would be interested in uh, working uh, for him in the capacity of US ambassador to a country called Belize. And uh, it took me a, a whole of uh, 15 seconds to answer, <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. President, it would be my uh, deepest honor and privilege uh, to join your administration in that capacity. So that was uh, how I got into um, my job as U.S. Ambassador. Wonderful. And, you know, you've obviously throughout your time uh, in Belize and even after that, you, you've interacted with many Foreign Service officers. What are some of the qualities that you have seen in these officers that have stood out to you the most? So, uh, looking back, I coming from the private sector, a lot of private sector uh, people, including me, that is, uh, somewhat have been somewhat. I was somewhat skeptical of uh, the quality and caliber of people who work in government, uh, right. not knowing much about. The State Department or the Foreign Service uh, officers or that uh, track of uh, uh, study and then work, mm -hmm. uh, I was very pleasantly surprised at the caliber and the quality of people that are serving uh, in our Foreign Service today. In the U.S. De uh, State Department, um, they work in various uh, cones, as they call it, uh, um, you know, political cone, uh, economic cone, uh, management, and so on. Right. So uh, I was just truly impressed um, in their ability to communicate, their ability to read and write, uh, and uh, be essentially our face right. uh, to the uh, uh, audiences which tend to be the host country. So whether they are in, the, in their public sector or in their private sector, uh, regardless. Uh, so I was, uh, I think it has to uh, do with the program of how Foreign Service officers are recruited by the State Department uh, and I was just uh, very impressed. Awesome. So, you know, with that, you are the first Indian American ambassador in U.S. history. Um, so you've obviously created a piece of history here. So can you tell us more about how that felt? Well, it was actually in that first 15 seconds, uh, uh, as I was talking to the president, I felt I would be the first one. Yeah. And I, for some reason, had a fairly uh, good sense that I would get confirmed by the Senate because, honestly, I lived a very boring life. I paid my taxes. <laughs> I, I, I did all the things by the book. So my sense, something told me uh, that I would get confirmed. Uh, 
honestly in the first few seconds of the phone conversation right uh, and then subsequently uh, in June uh, it was officially announced that I would be I was the nominee for uh, our ambassador to Belize would be me and uh, I got confirmed middle of July so uh, needless to say it was a deep uh, privilege and honor and uh, deeply proud of it uh, just to give you a sense uh, when the announcement came out uh, within hours after the announcement came out I was talking to Press Trust of India PTI a uh, fellow I was living at the time in Colorado mm. got a call from uh, this gentleman who told me who he was and he just went off asking me a uh, hundred questions about uh, how did this come about and right. so on and so forth right. um, so you know, I just feel very proud. I feel uh, it was uh, something that I cannot say this is what one needs to do to get appointed by a president. It was something I felt so lucky uh, that um, you know, I wasn't going to let it, uh, I wasn't going to take it lightly. I was going to do everything I could uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that I uphold the values of the United States uh, of America uh, and, you know, sort of be an Indian American, so to be this almost somewhat a hybrid, if you will, an immigrant who's come from India uh, at the age of a teenage, uh, in my teenage years. Right. Uh, so I spent many uh, years as an American already in the U.S. when this, uh, when this uh, opportunity came my way. I see. Um, and as I mentioned before, you were the U.S. Ambassador to Belize from 09 to 13. Um, how was your time in Belize? So um, I, I had a, a phenomenal time. Uh, both it was uh, really a twofer. My wife, who's a teacher, mm. uh, you know, she was a tremendous uh, partner uh, of mine. Um, my job, uh, not quite knowing. I mean, there is a sort of a training, a program, which only lasts for two weeks, a little over two weeks, eleven working days actually in Washington to train ambassadors in sort of the uh, do's and don'ts of, uh, of uh, you know what ambassadors are expected to do and uh, what uh, they should be uh, doing mm -hmm. um, so I felt in many ways unprepared when I landed in Belize I remember the date it was 15th of uh, September 2009 mm -hmm. uh, but the program the way it's coordinated by the State Department uh, they did such a phenomenal job in what to say to the press when I landed. I mean, literally coming off the tarmac, coming right. off the plane, there were three leading uh, television channels and a number of print channels there, a print paper, print uh, media there, taking notes and asking me questions. So um, from then to the day I left, which yeah. was uh, uh, just short of four years, um, I felt it was a tremendous experience. Uh, uh, got a lot accomplished um, in my in my time in Belize. So it, it varied. I mean, it was all the way from uh, working with uh, the health department to help uh, uh, in um, uh, combating yeah. common uh, ailments, uh, child uh, uh, diseases, uh, immunization, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to women's health. Uh, I worked with uh, microfinance to help uh, women entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Uh, improve their lives uh, um, and work with NGOs to help them um, do their work better. Uh, work on worked on a number of initiatives. On, on my wife's side, being a teacher, she helped to launch a children's book, mm -hmm. uh, which went, uh, uh, which was a big popular uh, thing. But mm -hmm. uh, then she went on to use that book uh, to help the work closely with the Ministry of Education in Belize to work with literacy. So she was doing a program with the help of U.S. Peace Corps. So um, something uh, that um, we are uh, very proud of. Uh, it was a great experience in Belize. Understandably so. Um, and was your time, when you actually first arrived in Belize, was that your first time in Central America? Had you made previous trips before? In, that was my first visit to Central America. Wow. Uh, okay. First visit south of Mexico. Wow. Um, so it was, uh, it was uh, something. For sure. And again, when you when you first landed, I'm um, assuming in Belmopan? Yeah. Right? So Actually, Belize City. Belize City, okay. Belize City, uh, Belmopan, which is the capital, doesn't have an airport at okay. Belize City, which is about an hour uh, away. Got it. So when you first arrived, 
what were some of the glaring issues that you saw uh, in the country and what were some of the steps that you took to mitigate them? You know, you know being from India, uh, and I go back uh, to India quite frequently of the 40 some years I've been in the US, mm -hmm. um, you know, it reminded me of India in terms of, I was uh, quite surprised at the uh, income uh, and the just the condition of the people and just looking at families, looking at children, looking at uh, just adults, looking at shops, roads, streets, lights, cars, what have you. Right. Uh, it sort of reminded me of India. So uh, I felt uh, in many ways, uh, so much of the world is at that level, at that economic level. So I just felt um, that this would be a, an opportunity for me to do something that would mean um, something good for the people right. of Belize. Right. So from the very beginning, I kept thinking like, what can I do? I'll be here for a very short time. Mm -hmm. How can I use my resources, my position, my authority, uh, so on, and my contacts and my influence overall to improve the lives of Belizeans was my, my first uh, impression and set of thoughts. And I was already sort of thinking like, I need to, uh, I need to make an impact make a difference right absolutely um, and what was the biggest challenge you faced in Belize so the challenge was uh, uh, how resources are allocated so this uh, this was actually all realized in the, my first few months up to up to my first year I realized uh, that the programs that the United States was uh, involved in uh, being a developing country being a poor relatively poor country was considered a mid-income country, but really compared to Guatemala, which are the na two neighboring countries on the southern and the western side, where Guatemala on the west and uh, Honduras on the south, those countries actually have lower incomes, per capita incomes than Belize. But I didn't see a big difference. Um, just to give you an, a sense, mm -hmm. Belizean per capita income is one third of that of Mexico. So, um, so I think the challenge was, what programs are we doing? What are the areas that we are spending our efforts, our resources, money, uh, I felt was misaligned. And I gave that feedback to uh, my colleagues in the State, in the State Department. Okay. Um, so very quickly I realized it wasn't the people in the State Department necessarily who are allocating uh, bulk of these resources. It was the U.S. Congress. Mm. So that was um, a learning experience for me and I unsuccessfully made some uh, pleas, if you will, to see if we could reallocate some of the resources and that didn't quite go very far. Okay. Very limited uh, um, success I had there. So uh, having realized that, I knew not to be spending too much time on things that were not going to uh, you know, result in anything positive. So right. I switched somewhat, switched gears and started uh, working with the resources I had, with the staff we had, we had about 30 Americans there at the time and about uh, 100 little, almost about 100 local hires, what they call locally employed staff. Okay. So about 130 people strong embassy and I said, what can we do here while we carry out the uh, regular work that we're supposed to, that uh, Congress has mandated and the State Department expects, expects us to do. Right. Those were all fine, but then I started undertaking additional sort of projects. One of them, as I mentioned earlier, is the uh, effort we brought the Southern Belizean Women's uh, Co-op into a, um, a program where they were able to borrow money, crowdsource money for okay. micro uh, loans, as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, we did some work with, um, my embassy did work with uh, US churches, a group of churches that were involved in medical uh, service sort of helping uh, provide medical services and dental services to Belizeans all of it free of cost because the monies were being raised in the US and the services were being provided uh, in Belize for sure uh, there was the uh, work that my wife did with the children's book and the literacy program mm -hmm. we hosted many events the launch of the book was at the embassy the Peace Corps effort uh, with the Ministry of Education in Belize was coordinated out at the embassy we did that privately, obviously, which is my wife and I and friends of ours who are raising money in the U.S., but we also used the, the sort of the 
platform of the ambassadorship and the ambassador's residence, the embassy itself, and it was all very much appreciated uh, from Washington because we were not using any additional money or right. we were not uh, uh, sitting and waiting for these resources. We just managed it. Right. So uh, just to give you some examples of what we did. Wonderful. Um, and I, I also want to transition from here uh, to talk some, about some of your other personal experiences. So many of, of our viewers may not know this, but you were actually President Barack Obama's roommate for one year at Occidental College. Really, how was that experience? It was, it was uh, you know, uh, college days, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously did our schoolwork, uh, we did what was needed, but what I recall is um, having lots of, uh, you know, joyful uh, times, right. uh, having parties, uh, but, but uh, occasionally going to a concert. So I have very fond memories. So having, in fact, in 1980, mm -hmm. um, the president invited, uh, invited some close friends to Hawaii to a, a couple of weeks of uh, just fun. I remember that trip very, in a very um, uh, fond way. Uh, so no, we had a we had a very sort of a normal, quite a normal college life. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing, we didn't go and do anything extraordinary, meaning something that was in the newspapers <laughs> or or on television that would be noteworthy. Right. Uh, but we were decent students, and uh, we did uh, what uh, what a lot of college students today would be doing. But we had uh, have very fond memories of those days. Makes sense. Um, and you know, besides President Obama. Who are some of the uh, some other world leaders you've interacted with that you found to be very interesting? So, as an ambassador, I met uh, other uh, sort of uh, I, I met heads of state and other diplomats, obviously, and uh, ministers of uh, you know minister, foreign minister types, you know, in yeah. the region in the Central America um, and in Latin America. But uh, if I could just switch gears just a bit. Um, in the second term, in the second term of President Obama, uh, the White House and the Commerce Department requested that I come and help uh, build, help to build a program called Select USA, which continues after the Obama administration. The Trump administration has embraced Select USA and supports it, and Select USA is running uh, uh, as it was designed and intended. <laughs> what Select USA does, or did then, and continues to do today is promote foreign investment in the United States. Right. It's called foreign direct investment. So the program uh, initiated was initiated by President Obama in 2011. Mm -hmm. I joined that program in 2013, immediately after I finished my ambassadorship. Okay. So that program um, caused uh, Forbes magazine to um, coined the term Chief Marketing Officer of the United States of America, and I had my picture, yeah. uh, it was the uh, end of uh, 2014 uh, issue. Mm -hmm. uh, what that did was that allowed uh, the Commerce Department to work very closely with the State Department to take essentially the pitch to all investors globally yeah. uh, to come to the United States, consider the United States to invest, consider the United States to either expand or start a business right. because we're a great place to do business Definitely. for all the reasons that uh, one can imagine. Yeah. A big market, an $18 trillion economy, mm -hmm. 320 million uh, consumers, uh, and with the uh, alignment we have with Mexico and Canada, that's you know 400 some million people, right. and all the free trade agreements that we have in place. So huge place to make and export and sell your products. So that was a very successful program. That program took me to 40 countries, right. of which uh, I liked, you know, uh, I liked uh, the experience tremendously. It was hugely successful. Mm -hmm. But two, specifically two leaders I met that were uh, just global leaders that really caught my attention and I've got you know, great memories, photographs, and all that with them. One is uh, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel. Uh, in 2016, we took a delegation of uh, uh, economic developers, state economic developers, and U.S. companies to Germany at okay. the Hanover Messe. Massive show, 225,000 people attended it, and President Obama was invited, and he was in attendance, along with uh, other um, uh, noted uh, cabinet members. But it was there where I met Angela Merkel, 
and uh, spent uh, two hours with her doing walking the walking the trade floor right. uh, trade show which had five thousand some uh, 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 boots right uh, but four hundred of something were u s boots mm. so meeting people like Microsoft and you know boot and and uh, many, many small and up and coming companies, US companies, it was phenomenal. It was a real noteworthy experience I had. Yeah. And the other one actually dates back to late 2014 and 2000, early 2015 was my uh, dual interactions with, uh, again, these were all uh, uh, with the president, right. uh, meeting Prime Minister uh, Modi of India. Mm -hmm. So I met him here in uh, September of uh, 2014, soon mm -hmm. after he won the first election. And then uh, fast forward to January at the uh, Republic Day, yes. he was invited, and I was in the president's delegation, so got to meet uh, the prime minister again. President was his chief guest uh, to to that. That's right. right. That's yeah. right. It was the first ever. Right. So he was invited by the prime minister to attend as a chief guest mm -hmm. for a for a huge event um, in uh, in New Delhi. So that was right. a, those memories will always uh, they're kind of etched in my. Uh, in my head, and I'll always remember them and uh, uh, value those uh, uh, two meeting those two leaders uh, and their uh, sort of influence on the on, on the world today. Awesome. So, moving on, um, in general, what are some of your personal favorite countries to visit? I, uh, of course, uh, biased. I'm from India. I'm an <laughs> Indian American, so I did multiple trips to India because yeah. we had a. We had a very strong relationship with not just bringing in the Indian investment here, mm -hmm. but Indian uh, government uh, wanted uh, some lessons learned and some sort of guidance, if you will, to uh, build a program of their own. So I actually worked with the ministry there, uh, foreign ministry there, to help them uh, with a program called Invest India. Okay. So this was Prime Minister Modi's uh, brainchild. Yeah. So, um, so I love going to India, I have family in India, so needless to say, uh, India uh, was a fun country for me because it's in a way going home for me. Uh, but I have to say I've enjoyed other countries as well. Right. So the most noteworthy uh, countries uh, that stuck in my head uh, was uh, Japan. Yeah. I made multiple trips to Japan. Japan is the second largest investor in the United States, second only to the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So I went not just to the metropolitan areas such as Tokyo, but I also went to some of the smaller uh, cities, uh, Kyoto and so on in Japan. Japan, um, I have a very special place for Japan in my heart, because uh, years ago I worked for a Japanese company as well, so there's a okay. connection there. So I would say India, Japan, and uh, one country uh, in Europe that uh, I fell for uh, is uh, Finland. Mm, okay. So the the, fin the Finnish people are uh, very tech savvy, and they have a mm -hmm. they host an amazing event called the Slush you know, every November. Okay. So thousands of tech entrepreneurs come to uh, Finland, and we have a you know needless to say we have a great relationship with European countries. Right. And Finland was kind of something I had not expected mm. uh, to have that kind of an impact, being such a small country. Right. So uh, I enjoyed. Uh, like I said, I went to about oh, actually over forty countries. So right. I went to many countries. Yeah. I don't want to say I didn't enjoy my time in those countries. Yeah. I do not know of a country that I didn't like. Yeah. Um, being an Indian American, being someone who has traveled and had this ex diverse experience background, uh, you know, I uh, uh, was very open in my views and so on. So mm -hmm. when I travel to these countries, uh, whether it's Canada or whether it's China or uh, or, or anything in between countries in the Middle East, uh, I like them all, I have to say. But uh, these three countries, I would say India, Japan, and Finland kind of came to my mind to answer your question. Okay, and personally, I mean, I haven't been to Finland myself. But after you said it, it, it's definitely on my bucket list. Um, but I can definitely say that you know, many of the people I've spoken to, uh, other people I've spoken to, sort of echo the same sentiments um, of, 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 that you just said, said that Japan sort of has this some some sort of effect on people like this magical effect. Um, it's culture. It's it's blend of of tradition and right. modern technology. Right. So that's wonderful. Um, and what are some of your your side passions outside of the workplace? So I um, I uh, try to stay fit. I walk. I go to the gym. But mm -hmm. uh, one of my passions is golf. Uh, so 
something. I'm not good at it, <laughs> but I love golf. Yeah. So I get out as many times as I can to go and uh, swing the club and try not to miss the ball. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and, you know, to conclude, Ambassador, uh, if there's one piece of advice you could give to an aspiring foreign service officer diplomat, what would that be? That's such a good question, uh, Anurag. Um, see, I, this, is, this is a country, I wasn't born here. I came here as a you know, late teenager and uh, it took me some time to settle in and you know, feel like I'm from here. And ultimately, you know, at some point I became a citizen. Um, my wife was also born and raised in India, but she has uh, sort of an American connection. So, right. um, so this um, nation of ours has uh, not just an amazing history, but some very special and unique and beautiful qualities. Definitely. So to project these values, to project these sort of views and ways of doing business, whether it's how we conduct our uh, legal system mm -hmm. or our business uh, or how uh, the volunteerism that is so uh, plentiful and ubiquitous, everywhere you go, people right. volunteer to right. do stuff, how we help each other. Uh, President Obama talks about uh, being your brother's keeper. Right. Um, and and that's, that's just etched into all people, essentially. I mean, right. most people, a huge majority of those, you know, Americans sort of are, sort of live in that way. And that to me uh, is such a, uh, such a valuable uh, sort of, set of um, uh, set of sort of ways of how one should live and to me we have the ability to tell our story to the rest of the world right. whether it's right. next door you know to Mexicans or um, Canadians but also you know to the rest of the world not to say that we are better than them but to just say, say that this American experience that continues to be so robust and so alive and so such a living uh, um, uh, living thing if you will that right. constantly changes and adapts uh, such a melting pot of so many peoples who have come we're a nation of immigrants uh, so so all these qualities that Americans have and America has mm -hmm. I think it's a phenomenal thing to say yeah. in terms of for a salesman that I was mm -hmm. uh, in Select USA, mm -hmm. it was what I call a product or a set of products to sell. Right. And it was so easy for me to sell that. And as a diplomat, I felt the same way. Uh, we are liked, right. um, and, and research has shown that we are liked in countries whose governments we have disagreements with, mm -hmm. meaning our governments, our government and theirs are at odds or not in agreement or in some cases in states of conflict. Um, even those people, mm. um, research has shown that they like America or they like American people. Um, so that's not just by fluke or some by odd circumstance, it's because there's something to like. And I feel, you know, a piece of advice uh, to aspirants, uh, young aspirants who are thinking or maybe, maybe thinking about Foreign service, but what does that entail? Is to go and proudly represent yeah. us, the yes. United States of America, the people of the United States of America, because it is an easy sell. Uh, that's how I feel. Absolutely. Um, and with that, you know, I am deeply appreciative of your time today. It was an absolute pleasure speaking to you, and thank you once again for all your insights. My pleasure. Yeah.